So I would like to thank the West Jersey chapter of the NHRS for uh, having me give this presentation. Dave, thanks for reaching out to me. We, um, I've been given this presentation now for uh, at least 10 plus years. My name is Greg Bosopoulos. I'm a technology solutions manager with the ODP Business Solutions Company, which was previously the business solutions division of Office Depot, but we recently went through a, a split and we're now an independent company and I reside in South Philadelphia. I live about a mile from where these facilities were. So uh, I enjoy the opportunity to speak on this. It's a passion of mine being born uh, in October of 1970, obviously I wasn't around even when the PR was around, but I enjoy sharing my work with others and I'm by no means a scholar or researcher. I essentially just do a lot of my reading through either books that I have or obviously now the wealth of information and knowledge that's out there through the public internet. So um, you might hear me typing some notes over here. I always like to hear if individuals have any corrections or whatnot, but uh, this has just been an ongoing presentation. So thank you. So I always like to start off and just say thank you. I gave this talk one time, December 7th, of 2013, and it was at the PR TNHS Philadelphia chapter meet. And always again, just like to say thank you to all the veterans and everything that the veterans have done for us and given us our freedom because without them, I wouldn't have an opportunity to even be searching a lot of the things on the internet. So I always like to just take a moment and say thank you for your service and sacrifice to our country. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. So the agenda today that I'd like to go through is really just a historical overview, uh, the relationship to the geographical location and, and why was it developed. Uh, we'll see some photographs of when it was in action, some aerial photographs to talk about its decline. I do have uh, some photographs on the dismantling of the facilities and then what I call the rebirth. Uh, but I will say the rebirth is uh, kind of interesting because it's gone through some different pathways, particularly even in the past three years. So again, this is just continual ongoing. And what I do usually is um, to see what's gonna happen with the facility, but hopefully this area is gonna to continue to see development and uh, we'll continue to see rail traffic. One of the things I always like to start out with is really the city of Philadelphia and get an understanding. So as with most cities, the, the waterfront was utterly important in its development. Uh, the Swedish farmers were the first to come to the Philadelphia region and uh, this shows you a really old uh, publication that shows you what Philadelphia looked like and a couple different views of it. And I also put down here, too, if anybody likes history like myself, there's two other areas I would always recommend. One of them is called the Philadelphia Lost Waterfront. That's a book that was written by a gentleman, Harry Kirikotis, really goes through a good understanding and even talks about a little bit of the rail and how it developed in that region along the Delaware River. And the other one is a, a great, I think it's about a 13 part series. It's on YouTube. There's 13 30 minute videos and it's called the Philadelphia Experiment. And I highly uh, advise anybody if they are looking to understand Philadelphia history, uh, great video to watch. What I found also interesting is in one of those publications, I think it was the section that dealt with the, the late seventies into the eighties. It talked about Mayor Rizzo, irrelevant to anybody's per political, um, affiliations, but interestingly, it, it states how Mayor Rizzo maybe wasn't a great mayor, whatever you want to say, but he was actually very instrumental in getting the funding in order to build the connecting railroad tunnels that connected the PRR to the, uh, the Reading Railroad. So great little video publication, and I'm a video learner, I'm a visual learner, so I highly recommend if you get a chance to uh, take a look at that. This is a map of 1898 and shows Philadelphia. And the reason I like this map is that it helps people understand really where the development of Philadelphia and how it occurred. So, and also uh, a historical perspective as to where the piers were and where they are now. So if you happen to look over in this area, um, this is, even though it says Greenwich branch of the PRR, if you follow this all the way down here, this is actually Washington Avenue today. So you can see that a lot of the piers at the time, and when this was uh, this map was done, a lot of the railroad piers were over here. So all Greenwich Point, and obviously this area down here below is where the current rail yard is. It wasn't even developed at that time. 
Uh, the other piece of this too, is that you can see the different railroads that came in. We had the B&O Railroad, we had the PRR, and then, uh, I'm sorry, let me correct that. The B&O comes along Washington Avenue, the PRR came along Oregon Avenue. So they're a little bit different horizontals, apologize for that. But interestingly, at this time, everything on the rail was still at grade level. So as Philadelphia was obviously starting to develop and you can see the movement here, center city and it's moving south. You can see the roads are being developed, the housing is being developed. Uh, this was, the, the railroads were actually limiting the ability for the growth of the city. Uh, the city was really important. It's 90 miles from, from um, strategic locations, even to this day. The Philadelphia Port, or they call it Phila Port, which was previously the Delaware River Port Authority, speaks about Philadelphia's strategic location to inland cities and why it's a vital port. And they even mentioned that it's the largest freshwater port in the United States. But nonetheless, this is talks about really the development. You can still see, obviously, over in this region was 30th Street Station, which comes down into Broad Street Station. This centerpiece right there is City Hall. So, If you look at a map today, this is what it looks like. So Oregon Avenue and uh, what was Washington Avenue and then actually the expressway that came through. So this expressway was, again, the, the Greenwich branch. I apologize, I'm flipping these around because I mentioned that this was Washington Avenue, it wasn't. Washington Avenue was a little further up, but this is really had gone away when they decided that they wanted to move all the rail yards as far to the south as possible, as you can see in this photograph in the corner. And then they wanted to build Interstate 76. So the docks again have always played a vital role in Philadelphia. And there's a really good publication that you, if anybody wants to read, it's available online and I highly recommend it. And it talks about how they actually went through the process of making the decision to remove the rail lines and actually elevate some of the rail lines. And this was uh, from 1913. It is in the University of Illinois, but it is available online. It's a great read. And it really just talks about how the city went through the Bureau of Surveys to get an understanding of what was the best pathway in order to move the rail lines as far as south as possible. And also at the same time to elevate the railroads to get them away from the grade crossings. Here's a shot of what the municipal piers were proposed to look like. So at the time the city was building municipal piers, there's only very few of these left anymore along Delaware Avenue, uh, but there are a few, but this is what the proposal looked like. They look very similar. So obviously they're like fingers coming out into the Delaware River. Again, the finger piers, you can see them all along the end here. And there was a lot of development even up on the north end on this side. So uh, here's actually Washington Avenue as it comes across. Here's the lower end. And you can see even in the Washington Avenue branch, there's a lot of photographs that are still out there. Um, some great aerial photographs. I, I have one in this presentation I might talk about it, but really good understanding again to talk about how they wanted to separate the railroads and push them further to the south in order to develop the city. This was uh, some proposals that were put in place for the relocation and the elevation of the railroads in South Philadelphia. So to the current state, rail line actually does cross over on the upper corner of this picture. It does come down. It doesn't follow this pathway as much, but you can see a lot of this line is still somewhat there. This was the proposed elevated to come in, and then it was going to come into this lower section here, which would have been the terminal yard. These were the proposed loca uh, relocations. Again, just a really quick look at the map. Here's a little bit further, uh, another map that looks at this was a, an aerial survey map from 1930. Uh, again, and interestingly, you know, that you see these little creeks that we're running through here. We talk about that all the time because I do have some friends of mine that live down here that still got water in their basement. So uh, there are still some creeks that run underneath the South Philadelphia region that cause problems. But um, again, you can see majority of uh, commerce that was occurring transloading at the time was along the Delaware River here. This is a photograph of um, a view, again, of the grade crossing. So this was um, the, south, the tracks between 25th Street all the way heading east to Delaware Avenue were at grade crossing. So this was the grade crossing of what they called the Schuylkill River Eastside Railroad. 
And this was at the broad, this is Broad Street in Oregon looking east. So if anybody knows what Broad in Oregon looks like today, uh, you can see a significant difference, obviously. And this was, I tried to get a good picture of this, but this actually came out of that 1913 book. So here it is again. If you look at now the photographs, if you look at the upper uh, right hand photograph, that's 23rd and Pashunk Avenue. If you go over to the right upper picture here, um, that is uh, 15th and Oregon Avenue. And that's looking east. And then this photograph is 15th and Oregon looking west. And this is actually what it looks like today. So I pulled this off of Google and you can even see this house and the building is the same. You can see the windows here, they match. And even this over here, you can see the facade on the front of this home matches over here. But you can see how the railroad at grade really just cut off any type of development south of this region. This is a picture looking north on 16th Street. Same photograph again, just showing you the tracks along the grade and what it looks like today. And then here's an aerial photograph. So if you think back to that other picture where the rail line used to come down and then turn to the east and head all the way towards the Delaware River at grade, uh, this is where 76 actually came in. And of course this leads directly right onto the Walt Whitman Bridge. And even under the Walt Whitman Bridge, when they built it, the, the uh, piers that hold up the bridge before it actually goes over the suspension portion is an opening. They even still had some rail tracks in there when they first built it. But uh, this gives a, a really good um, idea now what it is. And if you look along the side, you can see here, this at one time was a larger yard, but now uh, caught on the left-hand side or the Western side of 76, is CSX and on the right hand side is what we now call the 25th Street Viaduct that comes in. And that goes right over 76 and then they come together and continue south. <clears throat> this is a view of Pollock Street. Again, if, if I'm looking over in this section, I would actually be sitting on 76 now looking west before it bends to the right and starts to head up north. So the rail line, again, at grade came right across right through South Philadelphia. It's another view of the same area. And actually, here's what it looks like today. So Pollock Street runs uh, right just north. Behind me in the photograph is actually 76. So this street over here, it only goes about maybe six houses and then it stops right at 76. So, but this is what that region looked like. And here's a little cross bridge used to cross the railroad. So. As the rail line was elevated, this is what it looked like when in 1955. So this is a photograph of uh, this is still there today. It's very colorful. They painted the, the bridge abutments and whatnot. But uh, behind us here is the uh, Platt Bridge. Over here is the Atlantic Refinery, which is uh, now gone. But you can see one of the tanks here. This first set of girder bridge as you're coming off the Platt Bridge was uh, CSX now. And this second set here is uh, Norfolk Southern. But at the time, this was the entrance way. This uh, first set of bridges actually took the rail lines over towards Gerard Point. It used to be the Gerard Grain Elevator over there. And these rail lines, uh, these four tracks or five tracks here actually used to head down. They come below grade after they, after they come uh, over this bridge, they start to head down grade. Interestingly, you can still see some pretty good rail traffic coming out of this region because this is coming out of the South Philly Yard. If I were to take this one picture here and I turn myself and I look to the right, further up a little bit of the ways, uh, this is the um, Viaduct. And I took pictures of it because recently they're having so many challenges with concrete falling from it. They actually wrapped it in this, um, this rubber mesh, but interestingly rocks are still falling. I think they're trying to figure out what they're gonna do with it, but. Nonetheless, that's still a very uh, active thoroughfare of traffic coming in and out of the line. You can even still see that's got the majority of the catenary poles up. Obviously, the catenary's down, but still carrying power lines through. Here's an aerial photograph. Uh, this is 1926. So you can see 
uh, the municipal stadium at the time, which obviously after the fifties or sixties, they named it JFK stadium, but you can get a good understanding. You can see the line, the rail line coming in from this side crosses under broad street and then enters into the yard area. Here's the roundhouse that used to be there at the time, but, uh, everything along this side was not really developed. Now this, this area really fans out as it comes in, obviously this whole region here, <clears throat> um, the Navy Yard has seen incredible expansion at the time. Uh, actually, it's, yeah, around 1930. So, this is photographed. Here's a little bit closer view after Municipal Stadium was built. A little bit closer up of the same thing again. You can see the roundhouse um, over here. Here is the lakes, which are still there. Park is still there. So, a lot of this is um, still intact to some extent. A lot of people enjoy themselves here. So. The first thing that was built down at the piers was uh, Pier 124. And this at the time was built in 1922. It had uh, two rotary dumpers, could do about a thousand tons per hour. And then they had a six car thaw shed. The thaw shed could, uh, had a car, about a 60 car capacity thawing plant in order for thawing out rail cars that were coming in where the coal was cold. Had to thaw it out. They also had some side tracks going around it. And the way this facility worked is actually the rail lines came together into the two rails, went underneath the dumpers, went through a crossover, and then decided which kickback it would go up. And then once it came up into this region, there was a Barney that came out of the ground. You can see uh, one rail car here ready to go out the ramp. Obviously, uh, this was rebuilt in the 80s with Conrail, but uh, at this point, you had to move the ship where you didn't get any movement uh, between the, the apparatus that would actually dispose the coal into the barges or the ships. After the kickback, they kind of rolled downhill. This hill went this way. The other hill came around the other side. And I'll show you another aerial photograph where we actually see the, the, uh, there was a bridge that crossed over. Here's another picture of the aerial plant. Good photograph. Uh, this was uh, August third, August eighth, nineteen twenty nine. Uh, Dave, thanks for forwarding this photograph. So, really good uh, photograph. Though you can see the the receiving yard coming in through the fall plant and into the uh, into the dumpers. And up in this region, uh, this was actually the craw the uh, duck under where these rail cars, as they emptied, went back through a duck under. And then the majority of the rail yard is over onto this side. Uh, this is what they call Coal Hill. So as the trains passed east coming from Broad Street, passing under Broad Street, it actually started to go up very slow incline in order to reach the hill. Here's another aerial photograph of the, of the complex. Uh, this was June 29th, 1931. Shows you the uh, bridge. This is what they used to call Coal Hill. You see the old um, round table here. What I like about this is obviously 1920, 1931, you can see none of the yard is uh, developed over here. Over here, they did have a nice little coaling station I thought was unique. That was uh, for coaling uh, tugboats. And then this was the yard office, which uh, unfortunately was raised when they raised the complex. Here's a nice little book that was published uh, it's the PRR Philadelphia Ports is 1949 gives some good views of uh, operations too. And again, you can start to see here, um, this was the coal plant was starting to develop itself in 49. There were plans obviously to start to build Pier 122, uh, which went into commission in 1954. I always like to say you can't talk about Pier 122 without talking about Broad Street Station because when Broad Street Station was raised, the rubble from Broad Street Station actually sits in the pier. So it was built to the foundation of the pier. Um, Hagley Museum actually has some really good documentation. I was down there once and uh, good documentation on the dismantling process, even talking about the contractors that were used to um, raise the facility. But uh, so again, getting back to what I was saying about Philadelphia's location, I found this uh, pretty interesting. It just really shows you the distance uh, to these different areas from to New York and Philadelphia. And you can obviously see how much closer Philadelphia is and why Philadelphia is in favor as a port versus New York. So um, 
to this day, Philadelphia Port Authority still uses this data in order to promote the facility towards any type of uh, organizations that will utilize the complex. Here's another photograph from that same book. This shows piers 96, 98, and 100, uh, about 1.2 million square feet of, of footage. This is actually still intact. Um, not sure what they're going to do with it. This pier is here as well as the coal plant. So Philadelphia actually had uh, numerous coal plants that, that dotted the Delaware River as you worked away north in order to fuel electricity, uh, generate power. Obviously, that's not in, in use anymore. But uh, this facility over here is um, somewhat there, but uh, not seeing much. It actually receives about one or two rail cars a week. Here's the, uh, the um, ferry boat. And you can see the coaling tower and the PRR uh, water tower in the background up on Coal Hill. I enjoyed um, this was there for a pretty long time. I think they got rid of the, the water tower in the you know, sometime in the, the 90s, early 2000s. But um, some good photographs showing the, uh, the, 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 the float, but also the background. And you can see what's going on. And you can also see the coaling facility for the locomotives and that roundhouse in the background. So when I started uh, palling around, I guess it was, uh, might have been 2008, uh, I came across the company that was um, in charge of actually dismantling the piers. So it was a company called TerraSand. They had the contract and I happened to just go down there. Just always enjoyed taking photographs of riding my bike down there. And I got uh, friendly with the gentleman who was the, um, the foreman. And he ended up sharing this document with me, which, which really shows you what he had. Uh, on file, and then I've tried to do some some more digging into the actual the piers and the, and the facilities on the piers. So it was these uh, cranes were built by the Dravo Corporation in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and there were twenty ton twenty gross ton unloaders, and there was two of them when they were first built. So this is what they look like uh, during their first opening. So this is actually a photograph from the opening day. Uh, these are from the T.S. Martirano collection. It's just a water level view. Um, these were actually in Ken Rideout's archives and let me use them. But you can see that these were the first two cranes that were built. And then obviously the second two cranes uh, came shortly thereafter. Another photograph, aerial photograph from opening day, uh, 1954. And you can see a, a Wilson Lines boat over here. We'll get another picture of that. Uh, this was bringing in the first shipment of Labrador iron ore that was coming in to the um, to the facility. So you can see here the the facility how it was built. Again, majority of the rail line rail yard here is just starting to develop off to the right. Uh, the facility actually had two. It's an 800 foot dock, and then two conveyor cranes that actually worked their way up. They went up to a to a tipple. And then at that point, that tipple could also uh, measure, measure the iron ore as it's coming in. And the crane actually had aprons, so it would lower itself depending on which side it needed to unload a ship. This is a photograph of um, just the, the PR crossing again. I took some, some pictures here. One of them is, I have my notes, is one of them's, they had a, a note on here about Stadium Tower. Uh, which I believe was this lower one. That was from 1942. And then the interlocking drawing was from 1955. But you can see how much the yard has really expanded. And um, as, the, as the trains came in, they would first enter the, the coal cars would enter in this region. This is what I talked about, Coal Hill. They'd work their way up the hill, cross over the line. Uh, then this was the, the really the yard before they went into the falling shed into Pier 124. And then a lot of times there was a circuitous route that would occur where the coal would come in, those cars would be unloaded, then they would be moved over, then they would pick up the iron ore, then take the iron ore out to where it needed to go, whether it was the Bethlehem Mills District or uh, the Ohio Mills District. And then it would do a circuitous route from there, it would actually head north again, go to Whiskey Island, be on, on deadhead up to Whiskey Island, then from there be loaded again to head east. And then after it would be dropped off in some of the mills and the cars were then deadhead east from the, the steel plants back down to Philadelphia. So it was a very large route. Uh, there was some documentation on the Schuylkill, on the um, 
Shamokin branch that talked about this, the circuit is rude, but you can see how large the complex is now. Uh, a lot of this is, is not there anymore. And this actually used to be a hump yard at the time. So a little bit, a little bit closer. I don't try to remember this from what I took this picture from for the last time, but again, um, I'm going to show a photograph shortly of that opening day. So um, again, that there was a tugboat on the end, if you remember, that was the first shipment of Labrador iron ore coming in. That was August 5th, 1954. Um, it was Labrador Canadian province of Newfoundland actually is what, what, what brought that in. So if you understand and where, again, where Philadelphia is located and why Philadelphia, why the Pennsylvania Rail wanted to build this transloading facility in order to make it uh, more appealing towards its customers. One of the things to look at is where the iron ore predominantly used to come from. So if you look up in this photograph, majority of the iron ore prior to was always coming up from the Mizabi range. So for the Mizabi range, and if you look at the size of these um, lines, that's actually the tonnage that used to come through. So it used to come through down all the way down to Lake Erie, unload. When it would used to unload into Lake Erie, it used to head to the Eastern Pennsylvania Mills District. Then those rail cars would deadhead back down to Philly. And when they come into Philly, they would then pick up the iron ore and head west. But if we wanna look a little bit closer, um, this was some of uh, the tonnage that was coming in. So I want people to keep in mind, uh, Somebody mentioned before about Fairless Hills. Uh, Fairless Hills wasn't built at this time. Fairless Hills wasn't actually built until 1952. So somebody had mentioned that some of this iron ore that was coming in probably did go up the Fairless Hills up north along the Delaware. Probably some of it did. I haven't found that research yet. And I'd love to hear if somebody does know about that. But uh, Fairless Hills actually had its own unloading facilities. But uh, this is where a lot of the tonnage was coming, coming from. And you can see some of these preliminary numbers. And this was from August. This drawing or this uh, diagram drawing is from August 1st, 1953. So it's showing you the amount of tonnage that came into Philadelphia, a little bit in the Chester, majority of it into Philadelphia at that time, Sweden, South Africa, Tunisia. So again, I talked about Fairless Hills. Uh, Fairless Hills did have its own unloading facilities for ships. So uh, I don't, not sure if uh, a lot of, a lot of, the iron ore that came into Philly actually got shipped up there. But I also wanted to give people a little bit of sense of what iron ore looks like. These are called uh, taconite pellets. So taconite's a process where they actually take the iron ore, they heat it up and they actually make it into a more dense piece of uh, stone and it's round. So that's called a taconite pellet and I put a quarter next to it. Uh, this was a bunch of pellets that I found down there by the rail yard and I just want to give people an idea what the size of a taconite pellet looks like. So fast forward, as I mentioned, Conrail era. Um, next set of photographs I have, a, a lot of them are from this era. era. The first one's a nice one that shows you the actual, the four different cranes. So the first two cranes that were built were at, in this region. And I noticed when I started looking at the structure of the cranes, this, the third and the fourth crane are actually larger. They're higher. They, uh, to my knowledge, they still handle the same amount of capacity per hour, but, um, they were larger and they were taller and they had a different structure. If you notice up top, they had more embracements in the way that the steel was structured. Uh, here's another photograph from uh, Conrail. This was that building, the, the yard office that I had mentioned before. Not here anymore, but right in this corner would have been the uh, coal fueling for tugboats. Another photograph really shows you a good view of the conveyor belt as it comes up to the top. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, the tipple, because of the yard tracks were round, um, the yard tracks came underneath it, so it wasn't squ quite squared up. Uh, this part actually follows, I would say, perpendicular. This line here is perpendicular to the river, but then as it started to come through, it was a little bit different structure, and then you had two rail lines that were underneath, and then they had uh, shunt locomotives that would actually work to move the rail cars into position. Of course, iron ore needs to uh, fuel a blast furnace uh, 365 days of the year. And a lot of times that fuel is not coming in 365 days of the year, particularly in the, the Great Lakes. 
they get about I think nine or 10 months of shipping without it until the, the lakes start to freeze over. So what they do is they store it on site. So as the ore came up the tipple, they could have either brought it into the tipple, weighed it, put it into the rail cars, or there was a piece of the conveyor that actually came out on the back here. And this is a unique apparatus that actually used to ride along this elevated structure and would actually dump the iron ore into big piles along the side here so that they could stockpile it. So that when the time does come that they, they needed to, to run the trains nonstop to the blast furnaces in the winter months, they had a stockpile of iron ore. This is probably one of my favorite shots, give you a really good picture. Look how red the ground is. It's also obviously all iron ore that's on the ground there, but you can see um, cranes in the background, tipple, and that piece I was talking about. And then underneath here, and you can see one of the shunt locomotives is sitting right off the side. Other view looking the opposite way. You can see Coal Hill in the background. They had some uh, fuel tanks that were along the back at that time. Uh, I would say that looking at this, I can't tell if they're loads or not. I believe they're probably empties coming off because normally they would only run one to two uh, cars to go down through Pier 124. So it looks like these are probably coming off after they're empties and heading back to the uh, yard. So this is the down, heading down grade. But you can see the structure of the tipple here, really good. Um, uh, you can see this is the one rail, rail on the other side. And then in the middle is a narrow gauge for the shunt locomotives. Now you'll see the shunt locomotive off to the side. On the other side of this tipple, and I believe I have a picture, the shunt locomotive track actually cut off, cut across one of the standard gauge and actually head over to the side. And over here on the side was actually the uh, mechanics facility for the shunt locomotives. <clears throat> Another picture of the pier and Conrail days. You can see some, some loaders along the front here that were used at the time. Uh, some of the aprons are down. Majority of the aprons on the cranes are up. You can also see here, this is uh, after probably, I think it was 1981. You can see this large facility that hangs off the back here and um, it has a chute. So Conrail in 81 put in a conveyor system for Pier 124 that would allow them to actually dump the coal and then put along a conveyor system, take it up and, and bring it up on a conveyor. And then this uh, whole apparatus actually moved up and down along Pier 124. So you, you didn't have to actually move the ship or the barge. Now all you had to do is just move the, uh, the piece to it, the apparatus. Side view of the shunt locomotive Atlas car. There was four of these. Uh, one of them made its way to the Smithsonian Museum, which I think is up in Bethlehem. Uh, I forget where the second one went. And I believe there's still two of them down there right now as we talk, but uh, you can see size of the locomotive, diesel, and here's the, the uh, part of the arm that actually lowers on the side of the car and is used to actually move the rail cars under positioning of the tipple. So other view of Pier 124 again after 1981, and you can see the one kickback, but you can see this whole apparatus and actually moves on these um, concrete abutments with rails that sit on top of it. This is all gone now. Picture of Coal Hill looking now towards uh, the main part of Broad Street, I'll say the view west. You see the fueling tanks off to the left, diesel fueling tanks. Water tower still there. Uh, these are loads that are coming in. So it looks like these were probably sitting there waiting to actually roll in. And if I can think, we just looked at a couple pictures ago where these cars were there and I said they were empty. So they're probably the uh, loaded cars ready to be unloaded. You could also see ore jennies that are sitting here. So this kind of has a unique little bit of an S shape to the track. As these cars would come over to where this loader is, where my uh, laser is, that actually starts the turn where there's a um, circular track that they would go underneath the Colton. Here is a map quest image from 2011. So this is uh, showing you what the facility looked like uh, right before they're about to dismantle the cranes. This was the shunt locomotive uh, maintenance facility they spoke about. You can see the 
circular tracks, the loop tracks as they call them, they are still in use. Uh, sometimes I do see some rail cars still going around them. These four bubbles here were built later on. They're actually uh, very con large concrete bubbles. Right toward the end of their use, they're being used by a company called Growmark. They had, they had fertilizer inside of them, and it's actually a concrete dome. I, I heard that they actually blew up a very large um, balloon, and they actually poured the concrete around it to build these. These are still intact. Uh, this piece of the conveyor is intact. This was the piece of the conveyor that I spoke about that when in the cold season, they need to stockpile the ore. This is no longer there. The ore would have been stockpiled right around this location. And then this entire facility is all gone. Uh, the tipple, the conveyor belts, and also the, um, the cranes. Uh, this is an image from uh, December 24th, 19, uh, 2006. So again, an aerial image that I was able to actually capture and do a 3D image of it, but really good aerial view of the, um, of the cranes before they were dismantled. This was uh, from 2006 as well. Interesting, they named it Christopher Columbus Boulevard. They must have knew it was coming at some point. Uh, this now is actually a roadway. It is an extension of Christopher Columbus Boulevard, but. What I like about this is you can still see uh, two of the shunt locomotives sitting here. Uh, you have another shunt locomotive that was sitting off to the side and then uh, some bulldozers that are sitting around here. But uh, at this time, this was still a dirt road and you could drive back there at any time. Now it's, uh, it's all cart carted off and protected by security. <clears throat> this was uh, probably a sad view right before the end. You can see that they've already started dismantling the conveyor belt. Uh, this was again from the same time period around the, well, the, the image said 06, but you can see this is coming apart. Uh, over here, it's it's overgrown. They initially started on Pier 122 and then they moved down to Pier 124 into dismantling. So, same images. You can even see some gondola cars that are sitting along the side here. So, they did used to put those on loop tracks. And then this is uh, the bottom end of Delaware Avenue. There was even a rail line that used to come off the end of the of the yard and cross over and come, and you can actually see the tracks over here. Um, that rail line's not in use anymore either. They actually built a building on top of the rail line now, so it's another piece of the uh, Holtz facility. <clears throat> Found these images. Uh, somebody photographer I thought was really neat. Went ahead and uh, captured some pretty unique images at one time, but uh, it's just a neat find that I came across on the website. Thought it was interesting. It's, uh, it's a pretty lonely place when you're down there, usually very windy, but you can see the conveyor belt uh, infrastructure that was in place. And this would actually be taken from the tipple. There's another neat picture I found. Uh, sadly, this is what it looked like. Obviously it was rusting away before, um, before they knocked it down, but and then here's a good picture of the domes, the, the concrete domes. Again, they're still there. And this infrastructure, this, this uh, conveyor belt infrastructure is still in place. And this conveyor belt infrastructure is in place from where the tipple is moving on, that's all gone. And then uh, here's two little other pieces that uh, found interesting. Just again, it was an incredible facility. And this was built by the Heil and Patterson company, I believe the name is. And, they're out of, um, they were out of Pittsburgh, I believe. But uh, this is, uh, I think, late 1980s. I was interesting, I always like to tell a story. I was out at Valley Forge and me and my friends were you know, with my dad and we were playing along the tracks and I, I found the pellets. And at the time, 80s, I was you know in my teens, I had no idea what they even were. So we we're trying to figure it out, but they were littered all along the old rail line, which is now the Reading line. Uh, they were littered all on the line at that time. And I ended up having a funny story uh, by um, the late Steve Agostini, who was a, a really good friend of mine, told me a story that when he signed on with the PRR, one of his jobs was actually to go down to the yard and take old oily rags and shove them in the holes of the ore jennies because they would be losing half of their loads along the way. So that's obviously what it was. But interestingly, you can find these pellets still along the line. 
they're they're all on the line. You can even find them in Center City by Drexel University if you look closely underneath the uh, the old elevated. Here's a sh one of the shunt locomotives, number three. Again, this was a um, time when the water tower was still in, in play and the tipple was still there. Always, a, uh, this is a neat shot. This was the one that was taken from up above the tipple looking down. So uh, this is where the rail cars would come in as empties and then go underneath the tipple and then head back out of the loop track. This was the narrow gauge track and this was the switch of the narrow gauge track that crossed over the standard gauge to head into the, um, the servicing facility. If you're up on the tipple now looking the opposite way, uh, here's the, the, the tracks as they loop around. So we still have two shunt locomotives that are sitting on the, um, on the center tracks. This is that switch track, uh, narrow gauge coming off of the middle, heading in. And again, you can see the water tower still in the background. Interesting thing, this was an old, I think a P54, P MP54 coach that was sitting there at the time when this photograph was taken. Uh, this was 2005. Uh, this was actually Tom Gear's photograph. I didn't get this angle, but I was down there during that time. Photograph of what the what the conveyor belt looked like uh, right towards the end again, 2005 time frame, and not in use at the time that the grow mark was using the facility, and they put a cover over it to protect fertilizer that was coming in. The goal was to actually get the facility up and running again but i did have a conversation with somebody at conrail and he told me that uh, actually i spoke to the gentleman uh, his name is rick Mayer. He used to work for conrail he's also a friend of steve agostini and rick told me that uh he was actually one of the ones that were part of the project to go in there and really just decommission the entire facility that when these arms these aprons would lower down and then you would have a traveling gantry crane bucket underneath it. Uh, as it got out towards the end, because it was all mechanical, it would actually hit a stop, which would shut off the electric. And I remember Rick telling me a story that that, that wasn't even intact. So if somebody wanted to go use this facility and it was still working, they could have took the gantry crane and it would have went right off the rails because there was no stop mechanism to it. Unfortunately, it was too costly for Growmark to invest the dollars in order to put the um, cranes back in use. But they tried the best they could to use as much of the infrastructure, but uh, Growmark is no longer also in the, in the complex. 2005 again, uh, this is looking on the conveyor as it's uh, heading itself up to the tipple. 2005 again, you see a massive bucket over here. They had a couple buckets that were uh, different buckets that they would use, but you can see the complex. Of this complex from this point on is still intact. Uh, I think uh, when Growmark was there, they were trying to do something with it. This is a photograph that I had taken uh, right before dismantling around 2000, I think it was 2008 or 2012, can't remember the exact date, but um, really good picture of the three. The fourth crane is off to the left. Another photograph I took, this is actually from the Holtz dock looking out towards Pier 122. Gives you a good shot of uh, the crane infrastructure, the bucket in between. And what happened is obviously we'll dump it into a bucket, uh, into a typical little small bucket here, funnel. And then that funnel will actually control which conveyor belt I wanted to go to because there were two different conveyor belts. When I talked about those electrical components that were not functioning, uh, these little bars uh you know poles underneath that were actually what powered the crane it would ride and, and slide on top of it almost like the third rail of a uh, of a subway car and but this is where they got the power and the control another great photograph it's like a nice time of day you had the sunlight coming down on it another one i took from the back area you could see the maintenance shed over here and you can even see a piece of um, Pier 124 over here. Close up of the tipple. Uh, when you get down there uh, towards the afternoon, particularly as, as in the fall season, they used to have really good light because the light was behind us. So this view is actually looking uh, east, northeast. Another close up of the tipple. 
it was a very unique structure. As I mentioned, this piece came across and it was perpendicular to the Delaware River. And you could see, but how the rest of the structure was actually angled. And you could see the, um, the, the tip of buckets as they came down and would weigh the ore as the cars came underneath. Picture from underneath the tipple, 14 feet, five inch clearance. Water tower still in play back there on the right hand side. And then this is uh, a picture from the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Port Authority. So like the aerial view, it gives you a good, un, good view of, again, where the facility is with respect to the uh, city. And, a, and thinking back again, where the original line and the original rail yard was for Greenwich, uh, here is the Walt Whitman Bridge as it came in. So this was a video I was gonna play, but I couldn't do it, but there is uh, sadly a video and I'm happy to send out the link later, Dave, you can share it with everybody. But the, if you haven't seen it, there is a video that somebody posted uh, online um, that actually shows the first crane being pulled off to get dismantled. And essentially what they did was they attached uh, two very long chains to it, to two front end loaders and they actually slowly pulled it off the pier. And as soon as it got to the end of the pier, it just fell over and then they start cutting it up. And then they did that for the second, third and fourth green. Uh, thanks to Dave again, sent me this photograph. I believe I might've seen this. Temple Archives has some good things on, uh, on this facility, but Pier 124 in December 10th, 1981. Uh, you can and, see uh, a rotary dumper. The pictures were uh, thanks to Jack Schilling, who I believe yeah. is with us tonight. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Jack. I, I did see um, I did see that email come through briefly. So, but um, really uh, fantastic, uh, just amazing devices. And I think I might have some photographs of the uh, shunt of the um, the Barneys that used to put it up. But this is also a great photograph. You see the guy riding. Again, this is 1981, but you can see him riding the front of this. Um, this Barney is very similar to the Barneys that were used in Whiskey Island where as the Barney goes back down the ramp, it actually goes into a hole. And then as the rail car goes through the kick, goes comes through the plant area, goes through the kickback and then comes over here, there's a set of car retarders at the bottom, stops it. And then as the cable, and this is the wench house is below, as the wench house would pull on the cable and it pull the Barney, the Barney actually had a, a motion, it would move and it would actually come up slowly uh, there's also another video uh, online you can look up. Was, I think it's on YouTube. And look up uh, Conrail Piers 122, 124, and you can see actually the Barney coming out. But really, um, very unique facility. I like this photograph. I found this. I just wanted to throw it in there. This is the July 14th, 1954. So this is the first load of steel coming in for the new Delaware River Bridge, which is uh, actually the Walt Whitman Bridge. Uh, I think they called this Burma Yard at the time. But uh, what I liked about it is you got a good view of not just the, the, the um, beams coming in, special cars that the PR had to bring those beams in. And you can even see um, they had some trucks that were central to uh, carrying these loads in. But also you can see a good picture of Pier 122 and even 124. You can see the, the coal dust coming off of that. Here's an aerial shot from uh, the Philadelphia Port Authority, again, just promoting it. And like I said, there's a new building here. So these rail cars that you see sitting here, uh, they essentially go through a building right now. That's all done. These rail lines are still here on this part of the port and some other areas. The rail yard's been pretty well, but interestingly, this whole area over here, which used to be uh, the Navy Yard, and there was even a little airstrip over here. This was all housing. This is all gone. Um, Hyundai is actually bringing Hyundai and a company called Glovis to bring all the cars in now. They're utilizing Pier 122 to unload their ships. And there's a thoroughfare that kind of comes right through here, takes them over. And this is all cars parked, ready to be uh, moved out to dealerships. Another shot of the facility now. Tipples are gone. You can see the base of the tipple. Again, this infrastructure is in place. This long conveyor belt that used to go out and, and store the ore, that's also gone.
what it for the most part looks like today. Uh, this was the equipment that was being used to demolish it. Uh, this was again, TerraSan. Uh, this part over here is working on Pier 124. Uh, this was the video that I was mentioning and you can't see it too much, but you can see right here a little bit of the lines. This is how they actually pulled the, uh, the crane off the uh, pier and just fell. And once it broke apart, then that big uh, machine came in and started ripping it apart. It's a shame. This is what it looked like when the second crane came off the pier. So the last two cranes left. This was actually the, the third crane and then the fourth crane was already cleaned up but you can see the claw working on it. So close up, same picture. You can even see the truck that was actually used to have the, the crane would roll on. This is the facility coming apart now. This is actually looking down towards Pier 124 that entire complex is gone. You can see the two kickbacks over here. Uh, this was that crane that I was talking about that Conrail put in in 1980s that allowed them to uh, travel up and down the pier in order to put the coal into wherever bay of the ship that it needed to go into the hole of the ship. Some more pictures of the dismantling going on. One, one crane left, this was the third crane. Again, sad views. And this is really, uh, I have about 800 photographs of this. So I didn't want to bore everybody with all the photographs, but. Stockpile of the, uh, after they cut it up, ready to be hauled away. Some of the facility still intact a little bit. You still see the building is still standing today. The bubbles are still standing and the, uh, infrastructure for the conveyor belts are still standing. Everything else is gone. These buildings are gone. The small buildings are gone. Everything's been cleared out of here. Pretty amazing twisted steel. Uh, it's just a picture of me looking through the defunct crane, looking into the new cranes and they've actually even built high, uh, more cranes in this area. So they're trying to bring higher cranes in. they call them Panamax cranes in order to bring larger ships up to Delaware. Uh, this was a neat view looking actually as if we were on top of the crane looking down. So you can see a lot of the different components that were inside the crane, the motor. But uh, as it fell over, it gave you a good view of it. Uh, here was uh, one of the wheels that it used to, um, one of the pulleys inside of the motors. And the buckets were massive. You could see the reinforcement of the steel and the weld that were on the buckets. Obviously, ores are a very uh, heavy material, but... I think it was blank for blank blank Knox, I think was the name of the uh, manufacturer of the buckets. And they had them on these little dollies that they used to allow them to move around. This is actually the piece that would uh, sit above the uh, crane part of it and off to the side would be the cabs uh, that would actually control the crane as to allow the bucket to move and rotate and lower up and down. Two of the shunt locomotives, two and four. Again, I believe they're still down there. Haven't been hey. down there in a little while. During yep. this time, who owned all this stuff? What's that? Who owned all this uh, area? Uh, this was all, so it was PR, and then it went to Conrail, and then Conrail was leasing it to Growmark. So. Thank you. Yep. Dismantling, more dismantled shots. Uh, aerial after dismantling, you see the pier, uh, the what used to hold up the tipple. This was an interesting piece that I found down on the ground. When I looked at it, I got a little bit closer. I was like, "What is this?" Um, Growmark actually brought in something to allow rail cars to go up and actually unload them and try to get their fertilizer back up onto the uh, onto the the infrastructure for the conveyor belts, but. And I was kind of hiding away one time, but you can see it here. They had another conveyor belt that they hooked up. They tried to make it work, but again, Growmark didn't last long after this. Uh, they're no longer in the facility either. So the facility's not used right now. 
this was part of that conveyor belt that used to extend out where they would stockpile the ore. Uh, they actually took pieces of it and they actually tried to make some other type of conveyor system. They're doing whatever they could to try to get uh, the bulk material up to this location. Southport Marine Terminal, uh, I'll rewrap it up in about five minutes. I'm gonna speed through these a little bit. This is March, 2010. This is what that area looked like. You see the old rail line. Here's the PRR uh, water tower. Obviously, Coal Hill all gone right now. This was the proposal, what they wanted to do. So uh, this is Pier 122, Pier 124, Loop Track, Coal Hill. This is the entire area that, that they've been trying to build out, what they're going to call Southport Yard. Uh, again, what I mentioned before, the uh, Philadelphia Port Authority or Philiport, uh, they still use this drawing today to even talk about the value of bringing uh, products into Philadelphia for distribution centers and in, into the inland. This is also off of their website, Pennsylvania Department of General Services. This is what the new facility is supposed to look like. So Pier 122, Pier 124, they want to develop this entire area and make it uh, intermodal. This, this yard over here is sitting here. The Norfolk Southern built it, but to my knowledge, they're actually not using it. It's only a couple tracks for uh, intermodal. It's mostly still the yard at this time is still predominantly CSX. This was a crane that they actually put back onto Pier 122. Uh, it does have a bucket. Uh, again, I think they're trying to use it as a multi-purpose facility. This is that crane going back up. They put all new rails along the piers. This was a mountain of uh, iron ore that was sitting there it's since been removed. Uh, this was as they're replacing the rail that this new crane is traveling on. And this is the new highway that actually comes through the area, which used to be a dirt road. So a lot of cars coming in and out of here now. They're using uh, the, the pier to unload ships that have cars on them. This was that conveyor that I talked about that Gromark tried to do something with, and this is the, the uh, device where they're actually thinking of trying to ride the rail cars over. This little piece actually folds out, becomes a little conveyor. That would go into a, a hopper over here on this end, and it'll actually raise up, and they tried to get it up to this location, but it didn't, didn't pan out. This was the road that they built. That's Coal Hill. So they cut right through it. That's uh, looking from the road to what used to be Pier 124. 122 is off to the left there. You can see the new crane. Uh, at this time, uh, the pier, the water tower was still there. That's now gone. And that is my presentation. So I appreciate, again, um, your organization allowing me an opportunity to present. I continue to uh, build upon this. So I'm happy to take any questions and or learn from anybody if there's anything that was uh, any information that was miscorrect, misstated. But I'll take any questions at this time. Well, Greg, thank you very much for uh, sharing with us. It was